favorite fruit is raspberries. Rambutan. Watermelon. Cantaloupe. The strawberry. Cherry. The Macintosh apple. The apple. Apples. Apple. Apple. Apples. Apples and red pepper. Has to be their mango. Green mango. <laughs> Mangoes. Mango. <laughs>can you still hear oh, can you still hear me what a nice lovely film Mary Mazio congratulations we first met Mary two years ago when she brought um, a fantastic film um, called 1098 which was about a, a bunch of young uh, students in this country that participate in a very important competition. And if anybody could make a movie interesting about kids presenting business plans, Mary was it. But I'll tell you what, we brought a young man, uh, Rodney Walker, to our stage and showed this film. And Rodney came on the stage and he was the narrator of the film. And at that time he was a sophomore at George Mason University. He came from a family, well, he came from no family. His parents were in prison he knew 15 foster homes in his life. His older brothers and sisters were heroin acts. And um, somehow this young man decided to go straight and uh, had such a compelling story and it was a major feature in this movie. And um, because of the film and because of our audience, I'll never forget this, somebody paid for his entire college education sitting in our audience. It was really fantastic. Um, so, welcome to Mary. I think this panel is going to be a little bit about um, nutrition, given the people that are present here. Um, so, can I introduce to you Zeke Emanuel from National Institutes of Health, Robin Shepper, who has been with the White House Let's Move program, uh, Josh Vertel, who's going to be our moderator, Maz Mary Mazio, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking. Richard. Richard, Richard okay. Um, and I'm going to give it to Josh to take over this, but um, thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Lori, for investing in a fantastic film, and take it away. Sorry. For the questions. Yeah. So I want to start with you, Mary, and just oh. ask, well, tell me more why you decided to make this film. What was exciting to you about it? Well, um, Lori and I met actually at Aspen when, um, as Kitty mentioned, we did 1098. And Lori said, you know, I'm doing some really, the mayor has asked for help, um, and I'm doing some really interesting work with um, street cart vendors that are rolling fresh fruits and vegetables into places where, you know, you can't find a red apple. And I said, wow. I mean, I was really oblivious, frankly, to the issue. I knew obesity rates were skyrocketing, but that's about all. And Lori invited me to New York, and I hit the streets, and we actually had a street team to meet these vendors. And it was mind-blowing to me that almost all of them were first-generation immigrants, and that their stories were so parallel to all of our sort of great-grandfathers and, and grandmothers. And it occurred to me that no matter where you are on the immigration debate, that here are a class of immigrants that are in service to our nation's poor. And I thought the work that Lori was doing with her foundation was, it was a really interesting, creative way to come at the obesity crisis. It's not gonna solve it, but it's a tool. And so I thought, I said, where do I sign up? That's great. No. Go, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that was the genesis. That got you interested. Now, sh short of Bardo becoming the next Seinfeld, which would be great, <laughs> um, 
the, these people, they're doing incredible work, but they still face such odds. And uh, you know, th we have this experience over and over again where people make it to the next level and they pull the ladder up behind them. And I think we saw that with the shop owners and the debate about whether to let this through or not. Do you, having done this project, have faith in yourself that, that a percentage of these vendors will have ancestors who will be sitting at this festival? I do. do, I do. I mean, all of them wanted their children, all of them have children that are being educated in the United States, and so their aspirations are for their children. They are not here for a better life for themselves, they're here for a legacy, for a better life for their children and their children's children. And that just was so apparent to me. You talk to any one of them and they're like, I'm working like a dog, I work 24 seven, I don't have time for vacation, um, but I'm doing this for a reason. So it was really remarkable to see this class of people who are largely also invisible. Hmm. Since you finished the film, have you seen uh, things happen in these people's lives that have furthered this work? Have you stayed in touch with them? Yes, um, some of them I think will go on. This is a, such a difficult livelihood. I think hmm. some will go out of business. I mean, they are entrepreneurs after all, in the streets, micro, hmm. micro enterprise in the streets. Um, all of them had aspirations to be bricks and mortar stores. And that's like the classic American dream, is to have your own little business in your own little neighborhood. So will there be those that will go out of business? Absolutely. Will there be those that thrive? Without a doubt. And you see that with Bardo and Shaheen. They have this great, you know, they're organizing people. And Shaheen has, you know, 10 people working with him, 10 families. He's supporting 100 people. I mean, that's just a really yeah, exciting concept. Even though it's pennies, um, they're actually working. Hmm. Do you feel like this is a project that could be duplicated in other cities? Or what's to be learned from it? I do. In fact, um, there, are, there are calls already um, from London and Chicago. And in fact, Arthur Blank, who also owns a football team, said to Lori, let's bring this to Atlanta and get the NFL involved. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this is not going to be the perfect solve for every city. But the real issue is, what's the alternative to a supermarket that's so capital intensive? How do we get? fruits and vegetables, and for that matter, lean milk and you know, lean meats into these neighborhoods. This is one creative strategy, and there has to be seven or eight or 100 yeah. others. That's a great segue, actually, uh, talking to Richard. So Richard mm -hmm. McCarthy uh, founded and now runs an incredible organization called Market Umbrella in New Orleans. And it's a series of farmers markets, but it's also a farmers market organization that holds these markets together, and not just so that farmers can sell produce and uh, increase fruit and vegetable consumption, but really so that a, a local agricultural market can be a, a driver of a rural economy and also an urban economy and create bridges uh, between these two communities. You've done incredible work there. You have a different model. I'm wondering if you have any reflections on what you've seen um, and how you think that might play out in a city like New Orleans. What do you think? Well, in, in watching this film, I um, am reminded that on, you know, as we careened into the 21st century, this sort of amazing phenomena took place where we rediscovered public places, the informal economy, uh, food is this sort of cultural common denominator that we can use as a leverage, and we saw this explosive growth of farmers markets, which I, my work has, has been part of, and um, in the, the issue of the, the the food carts, I see such a similarity in looking creatively but sort of at the spaces between the buildings mm. and the populations that are often overlooked, uh, that there are, out of this, this sort of extraordinary food revolution, um, not one monoculture solution, but this incredible biodiversity that is taking root in the ecology of local economies. So food carts fill a niche. Uh, low entry point for access. Of course, the issue of local authorities and permitting is something that we deal with, farmers markets deal with, uh, the health department looks at food as a pathogen, uh, people on the street as an obstacle, whereas, in fact, the more sort of mature public health perspective is that this makes for safer places. Um, and I think in particular, the, the public social network that you see emanating from the carts or in farmers markets where you see uh, an assembly of independent vendors who are selling the fruits of their labor. Um, and these are becoming fulcrum for incredibly creative, uh, small-scale innovation, public policy innovation around market incentive programs, health incentives, targeting different vulnerable populations, bridging people together who otherwise wouldn't have relationships with one another. 
Um, I think, you know, from a farmer's market perspective, we look at at least a triple bottom line. Uh, the benefit to the nearby businesses, the benefit to the consumers, the benefit to the vendors. Certainly the sourcing of the food, you begin to get to see the complexity of how and where food is sourced and the potential to expand the local sourcing and the challenges that there are in the food system, uh, whether it's the point of production, point of distribution, point of sale, uh, there's been such a lack of investment in ensuring that wealth is generated among small business owners. And um, so I think this is an extraordinary you know, glimpse into what opportunities, especially in walkable communities. Uh, the business model here, I find rather refreshing, not brick and mortar. Yeah. Um, farmers markets, you know, we, we look at a big capital investment as whether to get a new tent this year. And um, instead, we invest in the social infrastructure and marketing. And uh, here, you know, here's, as opposed to, you know, another creative idea that has sprung up is the um, fresh food financing. But it, what I find so troubling with that is the business model of corner stores is not necessarily fresh produce. The business model of a fresh produce cart is fresh produce. So it strikes me as highly efficient. That's great. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask that you answer honestly. Mm -hmm. So you've got this model, and it's based on supporting local farmers, them coming into the city and selling fruits and vegetables. It's not a uh, corner store bodega that has limited fruits and vegetables. You're actually, that's the market you're in. And a community group comes up and says, we want to, we want to multiply the uh, Green Cards project in New Orleans. And the city council meeting happens, and you've got this base that they're your farmers and they're your customers and you want to build up that economic engine. You go to that meeting, are you in support of the project or against it? What do you say? <laughs> uh, I'm for it, it's public space. Um, Great. So the, the, the utilization of Great. public Great. space to incubate small businesses generates local wealth. Uh, our work is we run a farmers, series of farmers markets in New Orleans. We've sort of kick-started a renaissance of, of regional food economy and local markets. But we're also a think tank to evaluate uh, to evaluate markets, to professionalize them. And I think one of the most interesting things is the multiplier effect on the adjacent businesses. Great. It's actually greater. It isn't stealing, it's actually yeah. baking a bigger pie. I had the same way. I used to be a vegetable grower, and when I'd sell at a market, I found that also. Farmers would often say, no, we want less, we don't want any more growers at the market. When more growers came in, actually more customers came yeah. in. It's not, a, it's not a fixed pie. So one thing I've noticed, um, I live in Brooklyn, and I live in a neighborhood where there's a green cart because there's not very many places to buy fruits and vegetables. And I've noticed, and I understand why, because I get how fruit moves around, that the fruit that's there is not from the state. So they're apple pushers, but they're pushing apples that aren't from the big apple. Right? They're pushing apples from out of state. And that's a real challenge. And I don't fault the program or the vendors for it. But I wonder, given what your experience has been, and you're thinking about wholesale regional markets, do you have experience or ideas about how we could bridge that gap so that we don't have this disconnect? You know, Often the story behind the apples that are from far away are actually stories that are built on people being disserved and needing to actually come here for work. So uh, it'd be great to have them actually selling a product that has a story behind it that reflects these other values. How do you go about fixing that, bridging that gap? Well, our point of intervention was the point of sale. Mm -hmm. um, and that has sparked deeper investment, replication in rural communities to grow, urban communities to grow. And, and I think that the story across the US of this renaissance in farmers markets is very much the early innovators. The, um, well, and, and, and also, I think this is what I would certainly share with this program, is the dignity of labor of immigrants um, and mainstreaming immigrants. Uh, as I've seen in our farmers market and other farmers markets, they may have come to the US to pick strawberries, uh, wind up staying in a community to develop their own strawberry farm, and then enter into the market as business owners and to um, utilize their cultural assets, traditional foods, yeah. and, and work that into it. And we begin to see that, I think, in the shape of the different carts, yeah. begin to reflect the vendor, the neighborhood. Um, I think there's just been such a, a lack of investment in uh, growing the entrepreneurial side of small agriculture. The small, risk-taking, free market farmers that have kick-started farmers markets are now opening up wider opportunities for the medium-sized growers, mm -hmm. who used to look at the big-sized growers and say, I wish I could be like them. They're now starting to look at the smaller growers, saying, why are they having all the fun? Why are they opening up all the doors? I wish I could be like them. And I think there's, you know, whether it's farm to school or alternative distribution and sales uh, locations like carts and CSAs, there is an opportunity for that medium-sized grower to grow that entrepreneurism um, and to invest in our, our rural communities to be viable producing communities. Great. 
So Zeke, I want to jump over to you. Um, you know, we, we live in this country where it's easier and cheaper to feed our kids Fruit Loops than to feed them fruit. And it's a problem. And I was at the CDC and I thought of you, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, because I was talking with someone working on increasing fruit and vegetable consumption, and she said, you know, we've been working on this for 40 years, and we've seen two things happen. One is that fruit and vegetable consumption has stayed flat and maybe gone down. And the other is that the people working on cancer at the CDC are now debating us internally as to whether we should be pushing people to eat more fruits and vegetables because they're worried about pesticide residue. So we haven't seen, you know, we haven't seen any, any increase. It's just gotten worse in 40 years. Now, why is it getting worse? The assumption behind this film is it's access. And I heard you earlier today saying, well, you know, behavior change is really difficult. Where do we intervene? Is it access? Is it affordability? Is it education about how to cook? Where do you start? Uh, well, first of all, I think uh, it's not any single one of those things. It's all of them. Mm. This is a multifactorial problem, and it's not going to be solved by a single intervention. I think uh, the point uh, well made. Um, First of all, let's just put, clarify the pesticide. Uh, uh, fruits and vegetables are good. Eat them. Very good anti-cancer items. Uh, we know that about 40 to 50% of uh, uh, cancer is related to what you eat and smoking. And uh, most Americans actually don't know that. And it turns out when uh, the First Lady's initiative did a bunch of focus groups and surveys, you know, you, everyone knows, yes, Obesity, it's related to uh, diabetes, heart disease, but the fact that it's related to cancer is uh, very unknown in American society. Mm -hmm. But getting back to your question about where do you begin, I mean, all of those have been problems, and all of those are problems over, created over the last 40 years, uh, essentially. We eat a lot more processed foods. We eat a lot, out a lot more where portion size is bigger. Uh, we have kept our uh, fruits and vegetables uh, consumption relatively constant. Um, we have, it has, they've remained more expensive relative to, uh, as you point out, uh, sugar sweetened beverages and other items that have become substantially cheaper. But we're not going to change it, uh, first of all, overnight, and we're not going to change it uh, by doing any one thing. I think a lot of problems in America, we think there's got to be a magic bullet. This is not a magic bullet problem. This is much more like the smoking problem where there are a whole series of things that you have to push in the same direction. Um, and I do think, you know, one of the things to, to reflect it um, is how many of our kids really cook or how many of them have we actually taught to how to cook. I mean, we got rid of home economics and I may be the last generation that had home economics in school. Uh, only for the girls, though, mind you, um, and that's gone out. And you know, it's very important. If you can't cook, it's hard to cook nutritiously. And if all you do is eat out, it's very hard to eat uh, nutritiously that way. So I think it's all of it. I would say one thing, which in the last two years that I've been involved in this activity, I've come to appreciate a lot more than I had as a big barrier, is the whole distribution barrier. You've got farmers not far from big cities You've got people in big cities who want fresh fruits and vegetables, and one of the reasons you end up with the apple from Washington State instead of from New York State is the distribution gap. And that is a very concentrated gap. It is very difficult uh, uh, to break, and I think one of the things we're going to have to see is entrepreneurial uh, spirit on that side. And to give you one example, one of the guys um, floating here and giving some talks on food is uh, Robert Eggers, and he runs a very uh, important uh, organization in Washington uh, uh, that not only that trains people, but one of the things they've come up with is they had uh, it's a company that prepares uh, about 5,000 meals for uh, or began by preparing 5,000 meals for uh, homeless shelters uh, and other uh, community groups. They now have a contract for the Washington schools to improve the nutrition there. They run a catering business, and one of their big problems was getting fruits and vegetables that are cheap enough. So they went out to the Shenandoah Valley, about two hours from Washington, and there's tons of food that isn't perfect. It's not that it's not perfect, but it's too big or misshapen, and you can't sell it in the stores. But it's perfectly fine if what you're going to do is chop it up and put it and use it for catering or prepare meals from. They had to literally start their own trucking business to get the food from there. In. But they could pay 15 cents on the dollar, so it made sense. 
that actually is going to be, that is one of the big gaps because distribution is capital intensive. You need big trucks, um, et cetera. You need customers. And so, you know, as I, again, over the last two years learned a lot about this, that is a gap we're going to actually have to fill, and it'll help the local uh, farmers, the local sellers, because it can keep costs down. But I would say if there's, I, I would say, at least in this sort of access issue, besides the getting it out into communities, uh, to be able to get it cheap in communities and keep it uh, local, this distribution network is going to be a key problem to be solved, which I don't think any community is really perfectly solved. Hmm. Do, you, do you think that if people cooked at home more, it would fix these problems? And, and do you have any hope that that will be a trend we see growing? Um, I don't know about the trend line. Uh, I know that the trend line has been bad. Yeah. But let me just put it in a, the obesity problem. Uh, there is a relationship between eating out and more obesity. There's also, if you look at uh, um, salt, which has become an obsession of mine because it's uh, one of these things that we add. Uh, it's a huge problem in America. And if we actually solved it, we would save a whole lot of money. 77% um, of the salt in people's diets from prepared foods. You know, If you just cook, cook fruits and vegetables, meat, fish, whatever at home, you know, we solve that problem, yeah. you know, basically straightforwardly. And so I think uh, cooking at home is a very, very important element. Um, but as I say, it's gone out of all sorts of processes. And if you have parents who don't cook, it's hard for you to learn how to cook. Mm -hmm. Do you think the solution to that is in the private sector? It's uh, advocates, yeah, I education? Don't, I, 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 you got to have it all. all there, it, it, I Great. mean, as you've heard me, all of this about food is lifestyle changes for people, eating better, exercising, and those are very difficult things. And I, we don't know where the, uh, where the breakthroughs are going to come. Hmm. We're going to have to throw everything that we have at it. And, uh, you know, some of it will be effective in some communities, I think, as Richard really pointed out. Other communities, it will be a different combination of factors that will work. Um, but I would also mention that there are other, you know, Richmond, Virginia, has a, uh, a mobile bus, a guy who converted a bus yeah. into a fruit, mobile fruit uh, stand, and he goes around places. So there are lots of creative things happening out there. And for me, that's, I think, one of the most positive elements that, you know, it's now well established. I mean, I do think the First Lady put it on the agenda. And I think the, you know, American ingenuity and creativity that, you know, has been pointed out in, in the film you know, a lot of, lot of interesting things are, gonna, are, are happening, and uh, I think uh, in their own small way is going to help solve the problem. Great. I'm going to move to you, Robin. You've made this incredible shift from being the executive director of Let's Move now, or very soon, to being a senior advisor at the, uh, what is it, the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, which, does anyone else think that sounds like an, an impossible job? <laughs> but so you're doing this, and you have a particular focus on these issues, on food issues. You're looking at each level, at municipal, state, federal. At each of those levels, what policy changes do you think are necessary in order to increase fruit and vegetable consumption or flip it around so fruit's cheaper and easier to get than fruit loops? Well, a couple things that have already happened, and I think we need to highlight it. I mean, just... Uh, um, the dietary guidelines that came out in our new food icon, getting rid of the, rid of the food pyramid and having the plate is, is huge. Yeah. Um, so having your plate being filled with half of fruits and vegetables, um, and, it, and it was just released with like three weeks ago, so it's all new, but that is a, is a big thing that hopefully will increase demand. Um, and so I know with my kids, I have a nine-year-old and a five-year-old, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's front and center, and I'm like, okay, Breakfast? Do we have the fruit? Do we have the fruit and vegetables, or do we have the fruit? I mean, it's it's everything that um, it's it's a very easy icon to identify with. So, if we increase demand and if we want more fruits and vegetables, we have to look at what are some on the federal level. So, if you have something like the Farm Bill, so what are, if we're looking at the Farm Bill, do we have do we have the incentives and do we have all the things that you need in the Farm Bill that's gonna gonna help with fruits and vegetables? So so you know. That's one of the things that I'll be working on, but lots of people are working on, on, on the, those issues. So if we have commodity crops, fruits and vegetables, all those different things, um, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna create a farm bill that's gonna help with fruit, uh, the fruit and vegetable demand that we hopes, that hope that will increase? 
And you know, Zeke mentions the, the mobile uh, the card in Richmond, but you know, some just looking at the movie, um, obviously there were some issues that are zoning issues or, or other issues that that's not on the federal level. Yeah. So that's either you have state level laws or you have city level laws, and that happens all around the country. And the thing that, that I saw, uh, you know, working uh, with the first lady at the White House is that is just, you know, we heard stories from all over the country. And just like Richmond, you know, Detroit also has, uh, they, it was a faith organization that actually started something called Peaches and Greens, where they also have the vegetable, the fruit and vegetable man that goes around to the neighborhoods and delivers the fruit and vegetables. Or in Detroit, they're also looking at, they have so many, um, you know, one thing that I'm, that it was very interesting in the movie, and I think that's, uh, I've talked about it in the other panels, is just the cross-pollinations of these efforts. So this is, yeah, you can say this is a food revolution, but it's also economic opportunity. It's also community development, and it's also looking at about uh, pedestrian-friendly communities. So when people uh, with the Department of Transportation or uh, Housing and Urban Development or the Sustainable Cities Environmental Movement talk about more pedestrian-friendly, well, that's going to help. That's going to help with employment. That's going to help with um, these street vendors. So there's a nexus of this happening. Um, I met with the uh, met the mayor of San Antonio and the city council. They're looking at all their laws because, as they said to me, it's like you know we're the seventh largest city in the country. We have 25% diabetes. 25% of our population has diabetes. So we have to do something. They're looking at every everything that they're doing from from the environment to housing to the healthcare system. And so they're looking at zoning so that if anybody wants to start a new housing development, there also has to be availability of a school nearby that you can walk to. And then also it has to be availability of being able to get uh, fresh produce and, and being uh, you know, accessible for, for a store. So I think, I think it's happening and these incubators um, are happening more in the cities, I think, than more in the, than what we can do in the federal government. But every lever has to be pulled, um, as Zeke said. It's not one silver bullet. We have to do we have to do every single. You know, speaking from the obesity crisis perspective, we we look at early child. You know, what are we doing in early childhood? What are we doing in schools? What are we doing in access to healthy um, healthy uh, food and also in physical activity? And so we gotta we gotta do it all. And how do we leverage the resources? of economic opportunity, community development, job opportunities, um, access to healthy food, uh, you know, all those, all those things. And if we do it, if we layer it on each other, then we have a chance of solving this problem. That's great. That's one of the things I love about this project is that it can be an economic engine in the community rather than something from the outside. Uh, so it can actually be an engine that builds people up from within. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. I want to make a special request. And I think you've heard this request uh, from various folks on panels before. Think of like one sentence, maybe two, and have the second one end with a question mark. <laughs> and so no statements, just ask questions. And your job as you ask a question is to tease out something really fascinating from the panelists. We'll just leave it to 15 minutes or so. People want to try to stay for that. And then Great. Excellent. Yes. One of the problems I see here with the local markets, like you're talking about with produce and vegetables, is uh, uh, spoilage and pathogens. I haven't heard about food irradiation in a long time. I used to hear about it in the 70s and 80s. I was wondering if there's any, any talk at this level about food irradiation to you know, deal with those problems. Zeke, I think. First of all, it doesn't deal with the problem as if you're not going to get spoilage if you have food irradiation. Then we do have food irradiation in, in the country. But the point is, uh, right, one of the reasons fruits and vegetables remain uh, more expensive than processed foods is the fact that you have to account for the spoilage rate. And if you talk to, uh, say, 7-Elevens, one of the reasons they have been reluctant to get into the market of fresh fruits and vegetables is the price premium they have to charge on the fruits and vegetables. Uh, not only do they need refrigeration, uh, that's, you know, they already have it, but it, it increases the amount of load. But there's much more uh, spoilage uh, that they're concerned about. Uh, and so I do think there's a lot of attention uh, as to how to create supply that doesn't uh, spoil uh, in time. So that's a real, uh, I mean, this is a real live issue. But I think one of the other things we should say is uh, you will see in short order other, lots of big companies trying to get into this space too. Uh, I think as, uh, as uh, Richard said, the small guys have been you know, being innovative here, and I think the big guys have gotten envious, and so you're going to see some activity over the next year or so uh, 
uh, in this space of trying to make fruits and vegetables more accessible. Uh, I think there's something linked to it, Richard, you might think about, which is, sh which is shelf life. I remember growing salad, and once you cut salad greens, it's about 26 days until they're slime. No matter what you do, even under the best conditions. And it takes about 14 days to get salad from the field to a supermarket if you're in the large industrial system, whether it's organic or not. As a grower or as a farmer's market vendor, if you cut out those 14 days and you pick it the day before, a lot of these issues don't matter. Now, you can't scale to 7-Eleven and do it that way, but there are huge opportunities, particularly when there's no brick and mortar infrastructure, I think, to tap into that. I don't know if you've had experience with that. Well, I mean, I can describe the personal experience. After, um, I mean, I live in New Orleans. After Katrina, we found ourselves living for four months in uh, Houston and in our chaos going to grocery stores, whereas our diet was so based upon our, what we grew, the farmer's market, and, and we were stunned that we lived around the corner from a rather well-known grocery store, um, and the food would go off in two, three days, yeah. and it was just sort of stunning that we realized, my God, I actually do believe the hype that you know, we've been working in is this shortening this, this food chain that um, if it's picked yesterday and sold today, or picked last night, sold this morning, um, it lasts longer. Um, I think it tastes better. Um, I mean, those are one of the issues that are much less complex than food irradiation, yeah. um, and with, are within the means of small producers to be able to um, to, to bring in and, and play to their advantage of their small size. Is um, if their product can be fresher, taste better. Um, from the grower's standpoint, they might be able to get a premium price for it. And, uh, and I, I think the whole issue about pricing is really kind of complex. Um, for one, I think it, it's a misnomer. It's sort of the myth of the local food movement is that everything must be more expensive. Um, our research has found that that is not the case, especially with fresh produce. It's a very different rhythm of purchasing. Um, but what the chefs have taught us, uh, I remember very early on with the restaurant chefs that we worked with in the city, um, there's the price on the front end and there's the price on the back end. And if I have to throw away 30% of it, well, then you factor that into the price as opposed to I'm able to use all of it. And um, so I think how we, we, we actually look at the price points and look at the actual cost of the food, as well as the externalities that we often don't think about uh, around health and ecological impact. Well, I mean, one of the other things, Scott, that's worth mentioning is, Joel, it, it is going to be the, you know, uh, if energy costs remain high, um, the sourcing local is, the, the economics change dramatically. Yes. Uh, sh you know, shipping an apple from uh, Washington State to New York to sell it will, you know, it's just, just going to be a dead issue. We went through a very short window of time where an immigrant in this country would think, well, my way to get started is to buy produce from Mexico to New York. Yeah. My ancestors never would have gotten their produce that way to sell it from a streetcar in New York. Right. And that might change. Yeah. Who else? Yes. Hi. I wanted to ask, um, do you know what percentage of the thousand licenses that were opened up to people, like what percentage of those businesses have been successful? And how also has the city responded to the success of the program? Are they going to be opening or making more licenses available? That's a great, uh, that, that's a great question. Um, there was a cap at 1,000 permits. Um, about 500 have been issued and about 500 are operating. Um, it's unlikely that the cap will be raised because it was so controversial in the first place. Um, I think the degree of success, it's really hard to track these vendors. Um, they sometimes have cell phones, but they're not on the internet and they rove from place to place. So I think the city has had some challenges kind of in terms of accountability, um, but, and it's much more anecdotal, I think. Um, but the permits have been issued. People continue to apply year after year. It's a really difficult business. I think some of the people that started in the beginning, it's not the same margin as hot dog, right? Mm -hmm. And the hot dog stands, you're selling grapes and fruits and vegetables in these communities that have not seen this produce yet. And there's really kind of a lag time, if you will, um, as these fruits and vegetables and these options get introduced into these neighborhoods. Um, so again, anecdotally, when we were out, um, people were saying, it's a, it's a really hard life. These guys in the film were, I think, really enthusiastic and, and boisterous, but Jake closed his shop, right? So, um, so I think the success of the program will be two or three years out. It's fairly new. 
Um, but I appreciate your question. Others? Yep. Yes. We are often looking for agriculture as a place. Oh, microphone. Hi. Um, I'm a farmer and I spend a lot of time outside, so I've been noticing a strange weather in New York State and in a lot of states. Um, and agriculture is being asked to absorb the changes in the weather. Um, as an industry that is deeply undercapitalized and has suffered for 30 years from major structural crisis, famously in the 80s, Willie Nelson might have made that <laughs> apparent to everyone in America. Um, but still now, and deeply undercapitalized, you're talking about Hunts Point Marketplace, the distri distribution point, which is a municipally administered public, public facility that is housing this mega transfer of, of global produce into New York bellies. Uh, what kind of public and private investment and, and leadership is needed to recapitalize not only the monoculture system that's subsidized by federal farm bill money, not only the monoculture that we see in the supermarkets and the monopolistic practices that have pushed profit margins down so low, what will be the democratizing distribution strategy that we see in the next 10 years that are critical to keep food prices um, accessible to people who are um, in an economy that's pinching them pretty hard. Robin, do, do you want to talk some about investments? Uh, maybe starting with healthy food and finance? I don't know if yeah, your thoughts on it. There's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. <laughs> 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 distribution and where the capital comes from. The distribution uh, component? Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's going to be a, I mean, you're not going to see a federal solution there. Uh, uh, I just don't see that. I mean, I think that's a, a situation where uh, you are seeing, I mean, just take Walmart, for example. They're trying to redo their distribution system uh, on a regional basis. Uh, so that in, uh, I think they have one up the 95 corridor uh, in the East Coast, uh, where they're trying to source uh, much more of their fruits and vegetables along that corridor for their stores uh, in that corridor. Um, and you know, it is true that they have, uh, you know, every dollar they sell there is going to be split some between the farmer and some between them. Um, and I think that's the kind of arrangement. Um, but I don't, I don't see a governmental solution uh, to the distribution issue, if, if that's the question. I do think there's going to have to be a lot of innovation uh, uh, much more locally and uh, things like someone said it, seeing a, an opportunity here uh, to move. Uh, you know, uh, not quite perfect seconds, uh, which are perfect from the nutrition standpoint, perfect from everything but the sort of sizing, shelving uh, standpoint. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, do you have? No, no, no. Sure. One more question. Yes, in the middle. Hello, I have like two and a half questions. The first question is, um, uh, well, during the movie it was said that mostly immigrants took advantage of the licenses. Uh, so therefore, or at, at, like how many African Americans or like non-immigrant immigrants have these farm stands? And secondly, um, from that, immigrants tend to, set, t tend to settle in cities non-randomly, tend to uh, make urban enclaves with predominantly certain ethnic groups within that enclave. Um, so do these, uh, Immigrant sellers tend to sell their fruits non-randomly also in that they sell in their like urban enclaves. And from that, are African Americans still disenfranchised in that there's fewer vendors and they're not being sold to because they're not immigrants in the same way as Hispanics or Asians or Pakistanis, et cetera? Boy, that's a, that's a great question. Um, certainly, street cart vending in New York, let's just say generally, not necessarily in, in low-income neighborhoods, um, a huge proportion are from Bangladesh. Why is that? You know, I couldn't tell you. Um, but you do see certain cultural and immigrant populations that come in that start doing the same work, right? Um, Brazilians, at least near me, right? House cleaning, mowing your lawn. Mexicans are often in construction mowing your lawn. Why is that? I, I, I couldn't even, and this is only anecdotal, this is just you know, my own view of what's happening in, in neighborhoods. I have no idea, I think it's a fascinating phenomenon. Your question, however, about are African Americans disenfranchised, 
Um, there are some African American vendors in these neighborhoods, but I think by and large, this kind of work is, is well suited for those who don't speak English, right? It's so hard to make a living. You're out in the rain, you're out in the snow. Um, you can't leave your cart alone to take a bathroom break. I mean, you are really in the street and you're exposed to theft, to you know, shakedowns in the neighborhood. And I think when you speak English, other opportunities, they may be very low wage paying, but other opportunities can materialize. So I don't know whether it's the issue of African American or Hispanic, but rather, can you speak English or can you not? But that's a great question, and, and I'm sorry, I can only answer it anecdotally. I'm, I'm not a sociologist, but I will play one on TV. <laughs> I mean, I actually think that the issue of why ethnic groups go, you know, why did the Irish become policemen and the Poles, this, and uh, that's not that complex, right? I mean, you've got you know. fa family relationships. It's who you know. It's how you get uh, your, your job. I do think one of the good things or one of the important things which the movie mentions is the sort of capital, the fact that street, street vending is very low capital requirements. So that's one of the reasons you will see uh, new immigrants being able to do it because the amount of money you need to get started is comparatively small and albeit the African Americans have a very low wealth level in the United States in terms of accumulated capital, they have much more than an immigrant who's just crossed the border or come here. And that also will typically be a very big uh, uh, difference in uh, uh, what jobs people take and what, whether they start uh, businesses or not, and which businesses they can start. Um. Great. Great, so I think we're going to wrap here. One thought I have is these are low capital financially, but they're so high capital in terms of the human relationships that get built. And that really struck me because I think it's linked to disenfranchisement and empowerment. Uh, you know, I live in New York, and I, I am in these neighborhoods pretty often. And man, the idea that you have these communities encountering each other over food and the power of food and that joint experience and those shared conversations to build relationships, I think that is actually a kind of capital that builds power in communities that can lead to changes that are unanticipated and, and, and very potent. And I think for me, that's where I gain the most hope from this story. So thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it.